of the Genovese, and my family is one of the most distinguished of that republic. My ancestors had been for many years councillors and syndics, and my father had filled several public situations with honor and reputation. He was respected by all who knew him for his integrity and his indefatigable attention to public business. As the circumstances of his marriage illustrate his character, I cannot refrain from relating them. One of his most intimate friends was a merchant, who from a flourishing state fell through numerous mischances into poverty. This man, whose name was Buford, was of a proud and unbending disposition, and could not bear to live in poverty and oblivion in the same country where he had formerly been distinguished for his rank and magnificence. Having paid his debts, therefore, in the most honorable manner, he retreated with his daughter to the town of Lucerne, where he lived unknown and in wretchedness. Beaufort had saved but a very small sum of money from the wreck of his fortunes, but it was sufficient to provide him with sustenance for some months, and in the meantime he hoped to procure some respectable employment in a merchant's house. The interval was consequently spent in inaction. His grief only became more deep and rankling, and at length it took so fast hold of his mind that at the end of three months he lay on a bed of sickness, incapable of any exertion. His daughter attended him with the greatest tenderness, but she saw with despair that their little fund was rapidly decreasing and that there was no other prospect of support. But Caroline Buford possessed a mind of an uncommon mold, and her courage rose to support her in her adversity. She procured plain work, and by various means contrived to earn a pittance scarcely sufficient to support life. Several months passed in this manner. Her father grew worse. Her time was more entirely occupied in attending him. Her means of subsistence decreased, and in the tenth month, her father died in her arms, leaving her an orphan and a beggar. My father came like a protecting spirit to the poor girl, who committed herself to his care, and after the interment of his friend, he conducted her to Geneva, and placed her under the protection of a relation. Two years after this event, Caroline became his wife. When my father became a husband and a parent, he found his time so occupied by the duties of his new situation that he relinquished many of his public employments and devoted himself to the education of his children. Of these, I was the eldest and the destined successor to all of his labors and utility. No creature could have more tender parents than mine. My improvement and health were their constant care especially as I remained for several years their only child. But before I continue my narrative, I must record an incident which took place when I was four years of age. My father had a sister, whom he tenderly loved, and who had married early in life an Italian gentleman. About the time I mentioned, she died, and a few months afterwards, he received a letter from her husband, acquainting him with his intention of marrying an Italian lady and requesting my father to take charge of the infant Elizabeth, the only child of his deceased sister. My father did not hesitate, and immediately went to Italy, that he might accompany the little Elizabeth to her future home. I have often heard my mother say that she was at that time the most beautiful child she had ever seen, and showed signs even then of a gentle and affectionate disposition. These indications, and a desire to bind as closely as possible the ties of domestic love, determined my mother to consider Elizabeth as my future wife, a design which she never found reason to repent. From this time, Elizabeth Lavenza became my playfellow, and as we grew older, my friend. Although she was lively and animated, her feelings were strong and deep, and her disposition uncommonly affectionate. Her person was the image of her mind. Her hazel eyes possessed an attractive softness. She appeared the most fragile creature in the world. Everyone adored Elizabeth. 
If the servants had any request to make, it was always through her intercession. We were strangers to any species of disunion and dispute, for although there was a great dissimilitude in our characters, there was an harmony in that very dissimilitude. I was more calm and philosophical than my companion, yet my temper was not so yielding. The world was to me a secret, which I desired to discover. To her, it was a vacancy, which she sought to people with imagination of her own. My brothers were considerably younger than myself, but I had a friend and one of my schoolfellows. Henry Clerval was a son of a merchant of Geneva, an intimate friend of my father. He was a boy of singular talent and fancy. His favorite study consisted in books of chivalry and romance, and when very young, I can remember that we used to act plays composed by him out of these favorite books. In this description of our domestic circle, I include Henry Clerval, for he was constantly with us. He went to school with me, and generally passed the afternoon at our house. No youth could have passed more happily than mine. My parents were indulgent, and my companions amiable. I feel pleasure in dwelling on the recollections of childhood, before misfortune had tainted my mind, and changed its bright visions of extensive usefulness into gloomy and narrow reflections upon self. Reflections upon reflections upon reflections upon reflections upon reflections upon Natural philosophy is the genius that has regulated my fate. When I was thirteen years of age, we all went on a party of pleasure to the baths near Thonon. The inclemency of the weather obliged us to remain a day confined to the inn. In this house, I chanced to find a volume of the works of Cornelius Agrippa. I opened it with apathy. The theory which he attempts to demonstrate, and the wonderful acts which he relates, soon changed this feeling into enthusiasm. A new light seemed to dawn upon my mind, and, bounding with joy, I communicated my discovery to my father. My father looked carelessly at the title page of my book, and said, Ah, Cornelius Agrippa, my dear Victor, do not waste your time upon this. It is sad trash. If, instead of this remark, my father had taken the pains to explain to me that the principles of Agrippa had been entirely exploded, and that a modern system of science had been introduced, I should certainly have thrown Agrippa aside. It is even possible that the train of my ideas would never have received the fatal impulse that led to my ruin. But the cursory glance my father had taken of my volume by no means assured me that he was acquainted with its contents, and I continued to read with the greatest avidity. When I returned home, my first care was to procure the whole works of this author, and afterwards of Paracelsus and Albertus Magnus. I read and studied the wild fancies of these writers with delight. They appeared to me treasures known to few beside myself, and although I often wished to communicate these secret stores of knowledge, I was left to pursue my studies alone. The raising of ghosts or devils was a promise liberally accorded by my favorite authors, the fulfillment of which I most eagerly sought. When I was about fifteen years old, we had retired to our house near Bell Reef, where we witnessed a most violent and terrible thunderstorm. I remained while the storm lasted, watching its progress with curiosity and delight. As I stood at the door, on a sudden I beheld a stream of fire issue from an old beautiful oak, which stood about twenty yards from our house. And so soon as the dazzling light vanished, the oak had disappeared, and nothing remained but a blasted stump. The catastrophe of this tree excited my extreme astonishment, and I eagerly inquired of my father the nature and origin of thunder and lightning. He replied, Electricity. My occupations at this age were principally the mathematics and most of the branches of study appertaining to that science. I was busily employed in learning languages. Latin was already familiar to me, and I began to read some of the easiest Greek authors. I also perfectly understood English and German. Another task also devolved upon me when I became the instructor of my brothers. 
Ernest was six years younger than myself and was my principal pupil. William, the youngest of our family, was yet an infant and the most beautiful little fellow in the world. Such was our domestic circle, from which care and pain seemed forever banished. My father directed our studies, and my mother partook of our enjoyments. Neither of us possessed the slightest preeminence over the other. The voice of command was never heard amongst us, but mutual affection engaged us all to comply with and obey the slightest desire of each other. 